Hey, so I'm back in the United States, and uh, this is sort of the result of COVID. You've got this uh, this pandemic situation where the restaurants still want to make money. They still want to be open. So they've set up these uh, little tents outside. Um, but otherwise, you know, having been outside the United States for over, at this point, over a year, um, nothing has changed. I think that's one of the, the sort of the tragic things about America is that especially San Jose, is that nothing really changes, um, even though it should. You know, this store over here, there's a store here called Quench. It sells really expensive, uh, fresh squeezed juice. I think the last time I checked, the prices were about $7 US, uh, just for, you know, maybe something that was 12 ounces. It's still there, and I'm wondering really whether or not the people that are operating these things, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how they're, how they're paying the rent. In some cases, I know I know how. Um, you know, somebody, you know, somebody's got married to a millionaire, and the wife needs or the husband needs something to do, and so they open up a business, and that becomes the thing, right? So you, so you see how a lot of these businesses are not <laughs> meant to be profitable. And back in the day, when Amazon was starting out, people were complaining that you know Amazon would be in a position where it was not. Uh, it would soon go away simply because, you know, the stock price could not be justified uh, by its profits. And of course, Amazon was, in, was reinvesting all those profits into, you know, a lot of different areas of business. And sometimes it worked out, uh, obviously in the case of Amazon Web Services, and sometimes it failed, like in the case of the Amazon phone, which you don't know about because it failed. So it's sort of interesting because the stability, the stable and business environment in San Jose especially is also what makes it quite dull. Um, just like I said, there's literally no changes except for one shop back there in a whole year. So if you were to disappear for a whole year and then come back, it would be as if you never left. You can't say that about other countries. Uh, in other countries, things change, right? Business is open um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, obviously, if you have uh, too much change at once. The stakeholders, the people that built and invested, they probably won't invest again because they haven't gotten a, a decent return on, on the on the investment the first time. Capital is global; it doesn't have to stay in one place, or it'll go somewhere else. But again, the, re the reality is that even the gas stations are the same, uh, which is odd because if you think about the upheaval within the gas industry, the uh, oil and gas industry. You would think some, some of these things should go out of business, at least on the retail side, um, but they haven't. Even the, even the gasoline station is about the same. Uh, they're probably getting their oil from the same place. And that's the consequence, again, of all these sorts of upfront costs that go into American businesses, especially oil and gas. I think Chevron last year, or two, no, two years ago, reported a billion dollar, pro no, more than a billion dollar profit and then in 2019, reported more than a billion dollar loss. So it swung quite substantially the other way, 180 degrees. So I guess that's sort of the, um, you know, you see a lot of, the only changes you might see might be uh, some new paint on the apartments. Um, I don't think they've done that in the body here either. So again, that's, that goes back to, you know, the fact that investors want stability. They don't want too many changes um, within the within the U.S. Particularly, it's not that difficult to do on the national level because the constitution and the, and the structure of government is set up so that the national government basically has to cede substantial power to the private sector. So, in the U.S., the consequence of that is that you know a lot of the uh, you now have I think four trillion dollar companies: Apple, Microsoft, not Microsoft yet. Uh, Google, Amazon, and I'm sure there's quite a few of those that I haven't mentioned. I mean, even Intel, which apparently is falling behind, um, is still worth about $200 billion today in uh, August of 2020. So one thing that has changed over the last five years would be the level of investment in, in the physical infrastructure of schools, especially middle schools and high schools. I'm passing by uh, a middle school here and the fields are, but compared to five, 10 years ago, are brand new. 
I noticed the same thing when I was volunteering um, on the other side of the uh, city. Football field was brand new. So a lot of voters, um, what they do is they vote in. It's a baseball field back there. I'm not sure if you can see it. A lot of voters, when they see something on, on the ballot and they see pro-education, they've been, you can call it manipulation, you can call it brainwashing, but whatever it is, they've been convinced to continue to vote for educational improvements without calling for improvements on the output, on, on educational um, output. And so the consequence of that is there's pretty things, nice things that are shiny, that look good. But not necessarily something that's, that's, you know, that's improving in the core, in the soul. You can talk about the soul of a nation. You can kind of see that the structure, the economic system is not really built. If it's built for stability, it's not necessarily built to improve the core or the substance. Because it's really built to preserve the status quo so that investors are able to come back and invest and feel comfortable investing. And like I said, that's not, it's difficult, it's difficult to argue against that structure, um, simply because if you've traveled anywhere else, um, in most places, you can see that either there's no investment, and the reason is because you don't have a stable infrastructure, um, legally and economically, in order to sustain that investment. What do I mean by that? Uh, insurance, for one thing, um, loans. You know, the banking sector, for all of its faults, is an asset to the United States. It's an asset because it, it's supposed to be a prediction machine that allows banks to loan money to investors that then improve the quality of life. You know, that's different from, say, the government where they'll loan people money, like schools, and the buildings will look nice, but there's no, no actual uh, educational improvement within the students themselves. It's not supposed to be that way when it comes to the private sector, the businesses. And, but as you saw back there with that juice business, um, that's not no longer operating, at least as of, as of the last week, you know, you notice that even businesses are subject to external uh, factors. There's a school, we're still walking past one middle school, the same school. Um, it looks like all these buildings have been are fairly brand new over the last five years. So, you know, the real question here is, where is that balance? And I don't think the United States has found it. I think one of the biggest issues is that it's going to have a hard time finding it, that balance. If in fact, it's got trillions of dollars in debt that all these businesses have been, that all these businesses owe. And people keep talking about, you know, in fact, it was a Republican, a so-called conservative, uh, Vice President Cheney that said publicly, deficits don't matter. Well, they matter <laughs> until they don't. Um, they don't matter until they do. So one of the reasons is that, you know, you can obviously see that there are some serious issues, uh, not necessarily withholding US dollars within a pandemic, within a crisis, U.S. dollars still become a preferred asset to hold, thereby, you know, depriving competitors all over the world of much needed investments, investment, you know, dollars, literally. And so when they, when those dollars or the, those, that money flees from say Thailand or whatnot in 1998 or Malaysia, all the way to the United States, it makes it harder for everyone to make a profit because suddenly your currency depreciates in Thailand relative to the US dollar, but you still have to buy oil and a lot of other, other things that you need. Maybe even insurance, right? If you have shipping insurance, I don't know where you would buy that except for the United Kingdom under the pound. So, which is of course tied loosely somewhat to the United States, which is probably its closest ally at this point. So we're starting to see all this, all this sort of multi-layered complexity, especially with India and China rising up and demanding that their currencies be given some sort of the same similar respect. But you have a population issue that's both favorable and unfavorable to a strong currency, especially, well, although the fact that 
a lot of these countries that, that have large populations, um, have young populations, should be in favor of these countries. But you notice, once again, it's not necessarily favorable unless they also have the infrastructure. They have that bank, they have that, those computer programs that can tell the minimum, the, the guy being paid minimum wage when you apply for slightly above minimum wage when you apply for a loan whether or not the person sitting in front of him or her is credit worthy because if you don't have that ability to determine whether the person asking for a loan is credit worthy you won't have a banking system and within the u.s of course you know banks almost never go bankrupt um and it, in part you could argue it's it's, it's a somewhat somewhat similar to a pyramid scheme but it's really not in the sense that you know <laughs> you know a pyramid scheme is inherent in most models of business that assume higher prices over time simply because you need more people to buy more things in order to uh, create a system where value increases um, you may argue well that's not necessarily true <laughs> you know you've got supply and demand uh, if, if you have a lot of people buying things, you, you can lower the prices. That's true of smaller things. Um, that's true in general. But once you realize that you can't just sort of buy another physical real estate like property here, you can't just buy another you know, movie theater, right? It's a little more difficult. It's more complex. And so you'll notice that a lot of the businesses out here are pretty straightforward, right? Movies, restaurants. Um, they're not complex, like banks and a lot of other businesses. And the real question here is, as we're moving from a retail perspective, we're moving more towards a warehouse to house. In other words, a business directly from business to consumer with perhaps Amazon as a, as a, or some delivery agent as a middleman. The question is, what happens to all this real estate that's difficult to replicate? It's supposed to go up in value so that, you know, somebody else will come in, We'll buy these people out and then build something new. What we're realizing is that there may be a cap in terms of how much real estate prices can go up because you have two competing forces. You've got stuff like this that's difficult to build uh, that needs, that's highly specialized. It's not easy to build an outdoor strip mall that's you know easy to walk in, that provides shelter uh, from the heat and so on. Um, and so you've got these stuff like this going up in value until recently. And then you've got wagers being depressed because of that similar supply and demand phenomenon where production has become cheaper uh, for many reasons, um, technology being one of them. And so the prices of many things has come down. So that, of course, has depressed wagers, especially on the lower level. And what you can see now is that a lot of the people that are doing work at those so-called, well, at those lower lower wages, right here, um, a lot of them are doing work that's necessary and more necessary than what a hundred thousand dollar lawyer is being paid to do, and that, of course, over time is going to cause some resentment. Um, it's going to cause a lot of issues because you've got a lot of competing forces involved um, within the economy. And the question is what politicians can do to reduce inequality, especially when certain segments of the working population are probably more useful and more necessary than, despite being, than, than higher paid jobs, um, even if some jobs require a five-figure diploma, um, you know, the five-figure price tag for a diploma, while others don't. So these are all issues that people have to figure out. But like I said, I'm sitting here and I, if, if I were here a year ago and I've walked about maybe a mile, nothing has changed except for one shop. One shop changed. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't go there before, so I don't know what it was before, but now it's a cake shop selling really fancy cakes and cupcakes and so on. Um, and, you know, premium ice cream. So the top level seems to be doing well because people are still a bit choosy when it comes to uh, pricing and if they have the money to, to pay for it, why not? But for the most part, you're looking at every single thing being the same except for some cosmetic changes. And that's something that, you know, there ought to be some sort of balance 
Um, and especially now when we realize that we're in a position where the real estate prices and that, that inflation may not necessarily um, be sustainable.